The following interview was conducted uh, with Professor uh, John Van Fleet, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, School of Vet Me Veterinary Medicine for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April the 30th, 2008, in Stewart Center, the University Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years, parents, and high school education. Yes, I'm uh, not from the Midwest, so originally my family was raised in upstate New York in the Finger Lakes area. And um, I was the youngest of five in the family, raised on a farm, so I come from an agricultural background. Um, my parents, um, my dad was a farmer and my mother was a high school teacher. And I think that may have had something to do with how I eventually ended up as far as being in academia in that uh, she had a unique background because she'd been a graduate of Mount Holyoke and then gone on to teach and subsequently had located in the local community and met my father and subsequently that started the whole thing. So, oh. so that's the background. Yeah. Was it, what was grade school like? Was it a small school up there and was, what was the size of your high school? Yeah. It was small. The high school class was 35, so I guess that tells you right away what we're talking about. <laughs> it was, even at that, a consolidated school, so it had merged uh, some neighborhood schools into a, what they called a central school uh, at that point, but still it was pretty small by today's standards. Sure, that's right. And then you went out, uh, where'd you go to for college and how did mm -hmm. you select and tell us a little bit about college life? Right. Like I say, I was on a farm background, so I had a strong interest in going back to the farm. I have. Uh, two older brothers, and uh, one of them has stayed with the farm, runs the farm, and I had more or less anticipated going back to the farm. Uh, but then when I got into high school, and uh, had, uh, I did well academically and received scholarship support, why that changed my mind that I ought to hook on to at least a four-year college commitment, and I went to Cornell, the School of Agriculture at Cornell, which was about 25 miles from my home, so it was, it was nearby and well known to all of us at that point. So that was the point when I started at Cornell while I was in School of Agriculture and thought once again that I'd prepare myself to go back on the farm. But I became interested in veterinary medicine through some friends that I knew in the fraternity that I joined and uh, subsequently visited their homes and uh, got to know veterinarians and that turned me on to vet medicine and I changed my major from animal sciences to pre-veterinary medicine and then after two years went on to veterinary school at Cornell. Okay. What was campus like there, and what year did you uh, get your, your DVM or DVD degree? The DVM degree was given in 1962, uh -huh. and the campus uh, is not too much different than it is now. It hasn't grown like the Big Ten schools have. Uh, the enrollment at that time probably was eight to 10,000, something like that. It's a unique campus because it contains both state-supported schools and also private schools, so it contains both of those elements, which is kind of an unusual thing to have on campus, and the good thing was the students who were in one area of the campus could take courses in the other area, so it made for a rich sort of environment to be able to take classes uh, on the central campus, even though I was in the School of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then after you got your, your uh, vet, vet degree, then mm -hmm. what was the next step, what your career path before you mm -hmm. came to Purdue? I went uh, for, to practice for a couple of years, and I did that also in upstate New York. It was in a mixed animal practice, which included small animals and large animals. It was quite heavy on dairy cattle. So I got some, my practical experience uh, in veterinary medicine there, uh, working with a veterinarian who was well established, and it was a great experience, and I liked it, and it was hard to leave. but. Uh, after a couple of years, I realized if I was going to go back to graduate school, I needed to do it before I got any further uh, down the road and more involved financially. So I went to the University of Illinois uh, and did a Ph.D. in pathology and then came on faculty at Purdue in 1967. Okay. Was there any military service? Did you serve in the military at all? Or? No. Oh. I was on the edge of being called, and then uh, I was deferred while I was in graduate school, and at that point the crisis went by and I didn't get called. Okay, so you're lucked out. I did, yeah. in a way. <laughs> uh, now, the School of Vet Medicine, their why did they change the name uh, in 74 from Veterinary Science and Medicine? Yeah, yeah that was interesting. Uh, Jack Stockton was the dean at that time, and uh, he felt that the better name for the school would be to focus on the practice element, which was veterinary medicine, and therefore the name was changed from Veterinary Science uh, and Medicine, which had been been a little bit more along the lines of the basic science courses that were part of the school when it originally had opened. So they changed the name. Mm -hmm. And then now you were in the Department of Vet Pathobiology. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about that and yeah. your research in the students and the curriculum. Sure. 
that department has evolved. In fact, the name has evolved uh, two or three times since I joined. I joined and it was called the Veterinary Microbiology Department, um, Microbiology, Pathology, and Public Health. So it was a fairly complicated name. And then subsequently it was changed to uh, the Department of Veterinary Pathobiology, and just recently it was changed to become Comparative Pathobiology. So it's gone through three iterations over time uh, in the evolution of that department. It's a diverse department, has a number of different disciplines. My area was pathology, and uh, probably the largest group of faculty in the department were involved in pathology. Uh, and we're closely affiliated also with the Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, which is a separate building from the veterinary school. But uh, we use that laboratory f to get teaching material for the students and also um, provide service to the animal owners of the state. So it's seamless between the two units and the students go back and forth and we operate our graduate programs in, in pathology by utilizing the material that comes through the diagnostic laboratory. Mm -hmm. I see. And as the department grows, a uh, question for the researchers, uh, what focuses or why did the change in the name uh, occur? Yeah, it's interesting how that's evolved and clearly the last name is the one that shows the evolution of the department and that is to call it comparative. Comparative implies that it studies all species and also compares animal species to humans, so that's the thrust. Uh, that makes it much more competitive for NIH type funding because they're always looking for animal models to study human disease, but uh, uh, by having the label of comparative, it kind of puts it in a class where it stands apart from just being a, a veterinary-only mm -hmm. interest in the department. So I think that that's a natural to change it to that particular right. name. Okay. Uh, you, you did some work in uh, research studies with selenium and vitamin mm -hmm. E yeah. deficiency. Uh -huh. yeah. Can you tell us a little, are you still involved in that? Uh, not much in that area. My career has evolved in the research area. I, I did start out initially with some training in the, what's called nutritional pathology. So when I did my PhD at Illinois, one of my studies uh, did relate to selenium and vitamin E deficiency. And I continued that when I came to Purdue because there was a considerable concern in swine in Indiana at that time with that particular disease. And it wasn't being diagnosed and recognized, and I got involved with doing research uh, to study the disease, to be able to recognize it, and also how to treat it. So that led to a number of papers in the first part of my career. I've evolved since then to have more interest in certain um, organ systems, and my focus has been on cardiovascular systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, since then, my career is, uh, has been heavily involved with studying uh, diseases involved with the heart muscle, uh, particularly related to uh, my work with the bioengineering group on campus, Dr. Geddes and Dr. Uh, Tacker were the main uh, leads in that group, and they were looking for pathology support, and they were doing studies on hearts, particularly related to the development of defibrillating devices that could be used in humans, but they were doing the animal studies of that, and I got involved with them, and that led to uh, more studies in this area of uh, devices that are used involved with hearts, and I've uh, been doing studies not only with them, but also with uh, industry over time. Okay, very good. Uh, what about mentoring? Did you, uh, were you doing some mentoring with the students while you were uh, there mm -hmm. as well? Sure, it's a natural when you're going through as a, up through the ranks um, in um, the faculty that you're going to have graduate students and be mentoring them in particular, so that was always a pride of mine to, to have graduate students. I've, got, I've had uh, more than a dozen graduate students that have gone through master's and PhD programs. And I also get heavily involved with mentoring of the veterinary students because they all have faculty mentors that go through and uh, work with them, and that's always been a joy to have some time to spend with them. Oh, sure, that's right. Now let's move on to your associate dean for academic affairs in mm -hmm. 1988. Mm -hmm. um, one of your responsibilities is the chair of the admissions committee. Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting part of the job because uh, there's always a great deal of competition to get into the veterinary program. Uh, typically we have at least eight to ten times as many applicants as we do positions in the class. We typically take between 60 and 70 students each year into the DVM program. Uh, and there has to be a selection process which is fairly uh, sophisticated and takes quite a bit of time to go through the screening process to do it in the most complete and fair manner and uh, try and make the right decisions so we pick the best potential people who can become veterinarians. Does this, or is this for, un, is this the undergraduate or is this for the graduate? The uh, this is committee? for the DBM program, so okay. the students that are applying at that stage for the most part have three or four years of undergraduate preparation by the time they apply to veterinary school. Mm -hmm. Has the enrollment 
increased a little bit over time or? Um, it stayed just about the same and that's largely because the school was designed for that class size. So it was initially designed for a class size of 60. We're now taking 70 by squeezing a few more extra students into the into the classrooms and into the laboratories, but that's kind of the upper limit at this point unless we have a, a major increase in class uh, in, sure. in classroom facilities right. to accommodate larger classes. Yeah. What is the percentage? Are they mostly in-state versus mm -hmm. out-of-state? And yeah, you get and international students as well? Yes, Purdue has always taken a variety of students and of course has uh, been very attractive to out-of-state students. We don't get many international students, but we're one of the veterinary schools in the United States of the 28 schools that there are that do take international students and we will have as, as, uh, as many as two or three in a class that come from international origin. The out-of-state numbers aren't set and it varies from year to year depending on the strength of the in-state uh, applicant pool and uh, what we do is take all the highly qualified in-state students and then uh, fill the class with the remaining ones from out-of-state which we have lots of applicants from uh, with high quality out of state students. Do you get any, tra uh, can the students transfer in there if they take uh, courses somewhere else? Do they get any transfer students, say, at the second year? Mm -hmm. That's really rare to happen because, oh. for the most part, when students enter veterinary school, like medical school, they are committed for the four years of the right. program. So it's pretty rare unless you have an unusual personal situation, for example, where a spouse might have moved to the community or something like that. And it involves uh, a fairly um, sophisticated process from the standpoint that the original school would have to release the student to go to the other school and both schools would have to agree that the curriculum match and that sort of thing to allow sure. it to happen. So so it has happened but it's just not a frequent, very, very frequent very occurrence. Rare, right. okay. the, the Academic Leaders Program, mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. That's part of my position uh, as being Associate Dean for Academic Affairs that I chair also the Academic Leaders Group of the school and that's one of our two administrative groups. The executive committee group is chaired by the dean and I chair the academic leaders group. Uh, we meet on alternate times during the month uh, and subsequently um, have two meetings per month uh, with those particular groups and in general there's overlap between the two groups as to the composition of the groups with a little bit of difference that the academic group includes a couple people that are involved with the academic programs in the school that aren't involved with the other committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then curriculum, uh, the student activities, mm -hmm. uh, we've got quite a few of those. Any particular yeah. that you'd like to highlight on yeah. for the researchers? Yeah, that's really something that's changed dramatically since I came to the school. Good. Um, when I came initially, and this was common at most veterinary schools, there was mainly one club that the students had an opportunity to be involved with, and that was the, the what we call SCABMA, the student chapter of the American Veterinary Medical Association. So that was the club which represented um, their opportunity to learn a little bit about what organized veterinary medicine would be like and what they would be joining after they graduate, which would be to become a member of the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association. But since then, the profession has evolved to have many different specialty areas, and then now many of those areas also have student clubs. So I think we're up now to close to 15 different types of clubs that happened in the school and they're all affiliated with these different types of specialties. Uh, for example, like the bovine specialty group would have a club and the, the um, equine club has its own club, the exotic animal group has its own club, uh, and the list goes on and on through all the new specialty areas that have evolved in the profession. So that's something that the students have much more choice now than they used to with the extracurricular activities. I see, okay. Uh, the, the curriculum leading to the de Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program, tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that for the sure. researchers. That's evolved too since I came there. Uh, we've gone through two major revisions of the curriculum over time. Uh, the major changes that have been made recently is to make it more consistent with what the training is needed when the students uh, take their first job after they complete their DVM degree we've introduced what's called tracking or streamlining into the curriculum and uh, that allows them to choose in the third year of the program a focus area if, if they wish. Uh, if they think they're going to become a small animal veterinarian they would then focus in what we call the small animal track and they would take elective courses and then arrange their fourth year schedule so that they would spend the majority of their time in the small animal hospital working with uh, our faculty in that particular area. They still, however, could focus if they want in the large animal area, and even more so, they could focus on horses only. We have an equine track, 
or they could focus on food animals. We have a track where they could study uh, bovine and uh, beef cattle, for example, or swine. Um, and that's the way the profession has gone, now to have focusing in the species area. And um, we think with that type of curriculum, the students are better prepared when they go out. Uh, they're, they're more advanced in their clinical skills in those particular areas mm -hmm. uh, because of the tracking. That they have there, right, yes. The, that, uh, that starts in the third year. What about your, the cost and fees and financial support? Mm -hmm. You have quite a few scholarships that are available for the students. Sure. That's really important because it's become so expensive to go to veterinary school. It's much like human medicine in that regard, and the debt is substantial when the students leave the program. The students come in with some debt already because most of them have a bachelor's degree when they start the DBM program, so that means they're going to have at least eight years of edu higher education expense uh, adding up. And the mean debt for our students now is in the range of about 90000 so um, it's, it becomes a substantial investment. And there's a real concern for us that we may um, get to a situation where only affluent students will be able to become veterinarians. Therefore, it becomes more important to have the scholarship support, and sure. that's been a big drive in the school um, uh, to continue to increase the number of uh, endowed scholarships that we have. And uh, I've got a personal interest in that because my wife and I have established an endowed scholarship in the name of our parents, and subsequently that will be a legacy that we can leave. It'll be funded Very forever, nice. and it'll always be a uh, a student which receives the, our, our very, scholarship that's in our family name. That's very nice. What do the uh, students, what uh, type do, uh, do they do after they finish? Um, mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about sure. that for the researchers. They have right. many, what are uh, some of the options that they sure. can take upon? And that's evolved over time, too. Um, in the classes as they graduate, uh, the immediate change that has happened is that more of them are going on for more training beyond the DVM degree. So much like in human medicine, many of them now are taking what we call a one-year internship and then an additional three years of residency training in a very focused area. If they do that, they can become what we call specialists and um, take a certifying examination and subsequently at that point then become a board-certified specialist in an area like surgery or medicine or cardiology or dermatology or all the ologies like in human medicine are now present in veterinary medicine. So about a quarter of the class will go on for more training. The others that don't take more training will go into what we call primary care practice, and that is uh, they're going to be the first one that, a, that an animal owner sees with their patients. And that is usually focused along species lines. So that will be a high proportion of them. About 70% of them will go into small animal practice because that's where the biggest market and biggest job market is at this point. Uh, the others will scatter into all these other areas that I mentioned with tracking, and that is that they can go on in areas of, uh, particularly with horses or with food animals. Uh, they could be what we call a very broad or general sort of practice, and that's called a mixed practitioner who does all species. So that whole range of things is possible. Some will go to work uh, for uh, areas like uh, industry, like the pharmaceutical industry, like Eli Lilly, for example, has a high demand for veterinarians to work for them. Uh, the military employs veterinarians, so there's career opportunities there. The government employs veterinarians both at the federal and state level that are involved largely with regulatory medicine. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's another employment area which uh, is, is going to be present for them as they go through too. And of course, many of them are going to be replacements for myself on faculty, so they're going to be the researchers and academics of tomorrow. They're largely going to be employed either by universities or by, uh, once again, private industry would also employ those type of people. Mm -hmm. Very good. What about diver talk about diversity in the school? Mm -hmm. and, uh, of course, the women has increased over time. Right. That's really been a significant yeah. change, and in my career I've seen the whole switch because uh, when I went through veterinary school, uh, I would predict that maybe there were 5% of women in the, in, the, in the classes at that point. And the average class now that's going through uh, veterinary school in the United States has between 80 and 90, 85% women. So it's a tremendous shift that's happened over that time period. And it's now had an impact because we've produced enough female veterinarians that if you go to a local veterinarian, uh, about 50% of the of the practicing veterinarians are now f male and about 50% are female, so it's kind of a toss-up whether you're going to get a, a woman or a man uh, as far as the person you're going to deal with in practice. So that's really changed over time to see that. The other area that we continue to struggle with is to attract um, minorities to the profession. Sure. Uh, as the country becomes more and more uh, minority uh, in number, uh, 
I think the current statistics are approaching 30 percent of mm -hmm. the population now is minority. Uh, we've just not done very well from the standpoint of trying to approach that figure. Uh, the last few years in the classes that have come into our program, we've had about 15 percent of the class that have had minority backgrounds, and we've been really happy that we've been able to do better sure. in that area. But over the whole United States, I think of all the schools that are taking students, the average um, diversity as far as minorities is still about 10 percent. So we've got a long ways to go in that mm -hmm. area. Where do you do your recruiting? How, tell us a little about the recruiting mm -hmm. for the students, to the, mm -hmm. for the school. Um, it isn't quite as active as you might think. From the standpoint, we have a pipeline because we have our alums all over the state and all over the United States and even outside of the United States. And we often find that applicants uh, that come to us have learned about us from the alums that are out there. So there's a network working for us in that regard all the time. We do uh, reach out through our admissions department and go to high schools in the state and try and keep in touch with guidance counselors. Uh, we go to certain campuses that send us a number of students, for example, in, in state, and even a few campuses out of state that are kind of feeder schools, if you sure. will, to keep that link with them and make them aware of changes in the program and encourage them to apply to us. But like I say, we get a tremendous number of students that apply to us from out of state that have never been on campus, and they know us through our website or they know us through the reputation of the school or their knowledge of a veterinarian who's gone to Purdue and had a good experience and that's simply been our greatest draw as far as recruiting. And the, the online helps, the electronic too, with the website. Yeah. That's become more and more popular. <laughs> right. They know us really well from right. they can do a virtual tour of the school if they want online. So yeah, they know that's, us pretty that's well. That's pretty that nice, way. yeah. The Indiana Statewide Medical Education Program, mm -hmm. of which there's, as you know, we can't further researchers mm -hmm. explain a little bit about that, mm -hmm. how that uh, operates. Sure, that's an interesting model and that evolved during my stay at Purdue. I came in 1967 and uh, uh, Stephen Bering was at that point the dean of the IU Medical School before he became to be president at Purdue. So he was the one who made contact with the veterinary school in 1970 and had discussions uh, with our school to see whether we would be receptive to having one of the satellite programs at Purdue, and we were. We felt it would be a good uh, fit as far as having that program along with the veterinary program in the same building. So funds were put into uh, place in the school, and in fact, new space was developed in the basement of Lynn Hall uh, that was at that time, when I came, just open shell space. Uh, it hadn't been developed for the original building. And the funds from IU allowed that to be converted to classrooms, which were made available for exclusive use of the medical students who were initially here for one year of training, and then after a few years, they found it worked well, and they expanded it to have two years of training in the, in the MD program. Uh, before the students then would return to Indianapolis and take the, the third and fourth year mm -hmm. at the Indianapolis campus and then they receive their MD degree at that yeah. point. Are there other colleges within the state that have a similar uh, two year, students go there for two years? Right, there's seven of these regional centers uh, around the state so they're all located in the natural sites that you'd think of. There's a, a center in Evansville and Terre Haute and Bloomington and South Bend and Fort Wayne and uh, seems like I'm missing one, but there's seven of those centers across the mm -hmm. state. And these courses, do they, don't, do they take any courses in the vet school, or it's just that they're mm -hmm. physically, or do they? They do. Oh. Uh, some of our faculty do teach in that program, and in fact, uh, one or two of our faculty are MDs, uh, so they bring that background with them and teach exclusively in this program. So it's been a natural um, uh, use for our a faculty to grow from the standpoint we had additional support from IU to hire those people and therefore they're, they're members of our faculty. Mm -hmm. What's the uh, enrollment approximately? The enrollment per class in that particular area is, is about 16 students per year. So it's not a large enrollment but once again uh, there is a limit to how many they can take back into the program once they go back to Indianapolis for the last two years of the program. All right. Okay, good. Now, this, the uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, you've got your big anniversary coming up. You know, and tell us a yeah. little bit about some of the planning and uh, <laughs> the changes, the uh, technology has impacted on sure. it. Sure. That's, that's exciting to have that happen during the time that I'm here uh, as I reach the end of my career. Uh, when I came, the school had been, I came in 1967, like I said, and the school had been opened, it opened its doors in 1959, so, so I was able to overlap with, and, and with many of the original faculty and get to know them. Um, so at that point, I can, I can say that I can kind of bridge that last 40 years, at least, of the, of the program. 
the events for the year are going to be extensive. Uh, Dean Reed has uh, set aside a committee uh, which he's asked to plan these events. So there'll be a number of special events that occur throughout 2009, uh, which will collaborate the 50th anniversary of the school. And uh, these will include educational events as well as social events and certainly involve our students, our, our faculty and staff, and also our alumni. Sure. Uh, so it's going to be a, a fun year. Oh, nine is going to be a big year, <laughs> then, right. Then you had several deans you worked uh, when you, Who was the dean when you came? Was it Dr. Morris? It was Dr. Erskine Morris. Morris. Okay. Uh, he was not the founding dean, and unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to know the founding dean, who was Pat Hutchings. Unfortunately, he died uh, with the leukemia shortly after he founded the school, and that was totally unexpected. And uh, he was quite a young man when, he, when, when that happened. So when I came, Erskine Morse was the dean, and then subsequently Jack Stockton was dean. So I served under both of them and uh, was a faculty member under them. And then our deans have evolved more rapidly since then. And uh, Hill Lewis was dean, and he was the one that I was named to be associate dean under and uh, uh, took on that additional responsibility. And then he was followed by Al Rebar, uh, who was associate dean for research before he became dean and actually had worked with me while he was going through school. So that was always interesting because mm -hmm. he's one of my graduate students and one of those real success stories as he's gone on up the sure. ladder uh, completely. And then subsequently we had an interim dean year uh, where Elias Sem, who was our research associate dean, served as interim dean and now we've recruited Willie Reed back from Michigan State. He was here for his PhD program so he knows the st school quite well and is uh, it's kind of like having him come home once again to have him back, and he's been with us now about a year and a half. Yeah, very good. Fundraising, giving back, mm -hmm. how's, uh, from, from the school's perspective, mm -hmm. that's pretty act it's, it's an ongoing as it is with everything mm -hmm. on campus. Yeah, that's a big thing, and I think our, our alumni have been very supportive of the school. It's my understanding that based on numbers, we have the highest proportion of alumni that give to the school of any school on campus. So there's a lot of dedication uh, to our program from our graduates. So I think that's that's been something they take a lot of pride in and do support the school. Uh, we've certainly uh, reached out to have fundraising efforts to raise scholarship funds. That's a major thing that we know uh, has to be addressed because uh, otherwise we're not going to have uh, the, the chance for some students to come to Purdue. Um, so that's been a real priority. And now we're looking for more facilities because uh, we do need to have an additional expansion of our large animal hospital area and so this is a project that will partly will be funded by the state and we expect it will also have to do some private fundraising to make that happen. Mm -hmm. What about outreach? One of the things that you have every mm -hmm. year is your annual fall conference mm -hmm. and but are mm -hmm. there uh, for the research are there other aspects on outreach that the school is involved mm -hmm. in? Yeah that's an comment? important part of the operation. Um, as you know we operate uh, uh, teaching hospitals mm -hmm. and we have a small animal hospital and a large animal hospital and we also have an ambulatory unit which takes trucks and goes out to farms with the students so there's a great deal of outreach that happens to uh, clients in the immediate area of West Lafayette through that particular venue. We also operate the animal disease diagnostic laboratory that we talked about a bit ago and those serve the animal owners of the whole state of Indiana that can bring their animals to that laboratory to determine the cause of death and subsequently uh, arrive at a very quick diagnosis and hopefully uh, turn around problems that might be happening in groups of animals, for example. So there is a great deal of outreach uh, or engagement that happens uh, through the school and that's that's been constant through the time that I've been here. There's always been a major part of the mission of the school has been the outreach part. Yeah. Do you go to visit the farms outside this county uh, for the large animal? Do they do that? Or a can little they? bit. Oh. Um, some of the specialists will drive as much as 50 or 60 miles with students to work on animals. It depends a little bit on the area. Some of the work is done only in the county area itself. And the other major thing is that animal owners uh, will come from all over the state and they're referred by veterinarians in the state uh, generally in many cases, our graduates, um, then they refer the case to us because it's something that needs additional expertise that we have on our faculty or it needs equipment that we have and they don't have in their local practice, for example. So yeah. about 80 or 90 percent of the cases that come to us are referred from other veterinarians. Okay. One of the things that you're in, uh, enhancing on is the cancer thing. You've gotten mm -hmm. some equipment for that and with the cancer center on campus too, so it's mm -hmm. kind of a nice combination. 
Yeah, that's an important focus in the school. One of the areas that we've centered on in our research enterprise is to have four focus areas which we've identified and to build on, and cancer is one of the big ones in that area. Uh, the others are infectious disease, uh, neuroscience is a big one, and bioengineering is a big one. So those are kind of our four areas. We have a lot of vil visibility in cancer because we do have oncologists that are in the, in the hospital, and they're receiving cases all the time, and they're actively involved in research, and that's in collaboration with the Cancer Center on campus. And we have uh, a number of faculty that it is their major research focus is to deal with this large area of cancer. Sure, okay. Um, you got some awards, and you, you the vet, Indiana Veterinarian of the War of mm -hmm. the Year. Did how did you happen to hear about that? Did they let you know in advance? People, <laughs> no, I get a, interesting comments when I ask things. Yeah. 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 No, that was neat. That was <laughs> that was a pleasant surprise, and it was given at the annual meeting of the uh, Indiana Veterinary Medical Association, which is held in Indianapolis, and uh, it it was just a total surprise, and once again one of those really nice moments in one's career where you rec <laughs> where you have. Some of your former students have, have gone uh, to uh, recognize you and uh, have a, a special thing like that. Yeah. That's very special. Let's talk a little about your family. Where did you meet your wife when you were in vet school? Uh, or? Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, my wife had gone initially to Oberlin for a year and then transferred to Michigan State. And I had gotten to know her when she was at Michigan State. Uh, she had actually come to Cornell. And uh, subsequently, we got to know each other um, at that time. And uh, we were married in our in our third, after our third year in veterinary school, um, so we lived together uh, at Cornell. Was she a veterinary? Is she in, was in the vet school too? No, oh. no, no. Her background um, was uh, in foreign languages, so she's quite different from myself uh, in that regard, and came from a family. Her father was an English professor, so once again came from an academic community, and we uh, were married in the in the fourth year, as I said, and subsequently finished at Cornell, and then. We lived together in private practice before we went back to graduate school and had children at that point. We have two daughters. Did you, did they go to Purdue? They children? both did and okay. have their degrees from, from Purdue. Yes. Oh, that's very yeah. nice. Uh, how about an um, outstanding event in your life? Did something come to mind? You yeah, that's a share? toughie that's uh, hard to focus on one particular thing. Or a couple that you might have that yeah, comes to mind. There's certainly special events that you can think about. I, I, I would have to say uh, that one of the highlights as I went through my career at Purdue was an opportunity to do sabbatical leaves at the NIH. I did two, two leaves and actually went to the same unit, the Heart and Lung Institute, and worked with a, the same um, MD uh, cardiovascular researcher. And that really was a reason, once again, that I got to develop a really strong interest in working in uh, both with heart and vessel disease. Um, uh, my area of focus was looking at things with ultrastructure, the electron microscope, and I have a number of papers that are related to studies of the changes that happen at the ultrastructure level in different types of disease involving the heart. And a number of those studies were done collaboratively, collaboratively with my colleague at the NIH who was uh, named Dr. Victor Ferrands. Um, he was a, a very highly respected researcher known internationally. and. That was a unique relationship to have developed and led to a, a major push in my career, and I think it I think it benefited him too to have my input from the veterinary side. Sure, so it's a good combination then. Right? It worked out really well yeah. for both of us. Do you have a favorite memory of Purdue that do you come to mind? Once again, it's the opportunity to um, have worked with students. Um, I think as I look back on my career, the reason I came back to academia was because probably because of the stimulus of my mother being a teacher and knowing that when I was in veterinary school, there was something neat about being in that environment with students. And uh, so when I returned to do my PhD, I quickly uh, was involved with teaching and found that to be very comfortable. And when I came to Purdue, my, my involvement involved all three areas of both teaching and research and service, all three parts were there. But the one that really uh, was um, most rewarding and uh, certainly was a focus was the teaching part because uh, to work with the students and see the, the, the um, light bulb light up uh, with a student is, is something you just can't reproduce. Right. So. Yeah, and, and one of the things you know, I had your legacy as the Associate Dean for Academic mm -hmm. Affairs, have you got any comment on that? 
Well, it's hard to say exactly yeah. what it's going to be, but I guess once again, I would say working with students and having right. impacted several thousand veterinarians that have gone through Purdue and gone on to careers, and I see them all the time as I go out and uh, interact with veterinarians, and that's a real source of pride. Yeah. And I continue to get feedback from them that they enjoyed their experience with me. Do, you, do many of the alums, do some of their children, have they been coming to the vet school? Mm -hmm. That's quite yeah. a common thing now to see, right. and each class will have several second generation veterinarians coming through. So that's another source of uh, delight to be able to see somebody that you've had in the classroom originally now sending their son or daughter to us yes. and seeing them go through the program. That's very nice. <laughs> Any uh, closing comments or anything that you'd like to say to in some summation? Well, once away. again, it's been it's just an unusual thing to have a career where you spend your entire academic career on one campus, and I certainly didn't plan it that way. When I finished my PhD, I looked at several positions, and with my training in pathology, it's quite common that also people look at going to industry to work, and I did look at that a little bit, but it clearly was not the focus that I really wanted to go into. Uh, so I looked at four or five veterinary schools that had positions open at that time, and uh, it was a tough choice, but I finally decided that Purdue was the right fit. So I came here, and it's just been one thing after another, working with the people here that I felt very comfortable in this environment and felt appreciated and uh, subsequently have stayed here, even though there have been opportunities to leave. But this has now become my entire focus, and I'm, I'm pr pleased and proud to have spent my career at Purdue. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Fleet. This concludes the interview, and I thank you. Thank okay. you very Thanks. much. My Professor pleasure. <laughs>